I'm Ken Chitwood, researcher in Global Islamic Studies and Lutheran pastor. Today we're going to be talking about anti-Muslim hate, prejudice against Muslims, or as it's sometimes called, Islamophobia. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why is Lutherans for Racial Justice talking about a religious issue? Religions aren't races. Islam is not a race. You're right. But over time, and in many and various ways, religious traditions and religious people have been racialized. That is to say, certain religions have been made into racial categories. Although there are many different people groups that can and do practice Islam, Islam has been racialized. As a result, Muslims and others, like Sikhs, have been racially abused. Bottom line, learning more about Muslims and how they suffer from racial prejudice, injustice, and abuse, often because of our thoughts, words, and deeds, can help us better fulfill Christ's call to love our neighbor. Jordan Denary Duffner is pursuing a doctorate in theological and religious studies at Georgetown University. She's the author of Finding Jesus Among Muslims, How Loving Islam Makes Me a Better Catholic. Her writing on Muslim-Christian relations and Islamophobia has appeared in numerous publications, including the Washington Post, Time, and America Magazine. In 2013, she was a Fulbright researcher in Amman, Jordan. Her new book is Islamophobia, What Christians Should Know, and do about anti-Muslim discrimination. And that's why I'm excited to speak with her today. Welcome, Jordan. Thanks so much for having me. Where I start with every author is, you know, why did you want to write this book in particular? In the work that I was doing, the writing that I was doing for Christian audiences about Islamophobia, there was a need for um, something longer and more robust that could address a lot of the hesitations that Christians have about Islam and Muslims, um, and to also talk about um, the many different ways that Islamophobia impacts Muslim communities. And, um, and, and to also be frank and honest about the ways that Islamophobia has unfortunately um, uh, been manifested in our Christian communities. And you know, on a positive note to say, this is what we can do. We actually have a positive role to play in upending this form of prejudice and discrimination. Uh, would you talk about, I guess, uh, your experience with Islamophobia within Christian communities and how that kind of, I don't know, riled you up a bit <laughs> to, to want to write something like this? Several years ago now, over a decade ago, um, I received a chain email from a close family friend in my Catholic community. And this uh, email had circulated through uh, a bunch of different families in my Catholic parish back in Indianapolis, Indiana, where I grew up. And it was this anti-Muslim uh, chain email. And, and you know, this was sort of before this kind of stuff migrated onto Facebook or social media. So chain emails were really the place where this kind of Islamophobic information um, would, would spread. And uh, the, the chain email basically equated everyday Muslims with the, you know, the terrorists that we see on television. And um, this, this family that had sent this email along to mine um, were people that we were very close to, people who were very um, uh, active in our Catholic faith community and who were good people, who were kind, generous, wonderful people, as were all of the other people who had forwarded the email to them in the first place. And so I, I had this, um, there was this strange disconnect that I was feeling where, you know, this is our, our Catholic faith community that is, is doing our best to live up to these, these ideals and these values that we have. And, but we're not living up to them or, or the, the, these people who, who forwarded the email didn't see, they weren't able to understand how forwarding along an email like this mm -hmm. Um, is in contradiction to our faith tradition and, and the, the love and the hospitality and the welcome that, that we preach, that, that's preached to us at mass and that we, that we strive to live out in our lives. And, um, you know, I was, I was pretty young when, when we received this message, but um, it very much propelled my interest in Islam and, and, and also my interest in helping my own Christian faith community to remedy this disconnect. And that's kind of what I see the 
that's what I'm hoping to do in the book is to help our Christian faith communities, which have these wonderful teachings and ideals to, to really live up to them and to understand how the work of, of combating Islamophobia is, is a natural expression of what it means to be a Christian, regardless of, of what your denomination may be. Yeah, I really appreciate how you talk about uh, remedying this because you know we, we've got the goods to address this. This is at the very heart of our faith. And one of the things you also kind of ask Christians to do or impel Christians to do is to recognize the Islamophobia in their communities. That, that's one of the first things they can do because mm -hmm. that often goes ignored. Or, or, or not noticed or, or not remarked upon. So many of the anti-Muslim stereotypes that underpin all the different forms of Islamophobia that we see, they are taken to be conventional wisdom by many in our Christian communities. So I think one of the challenges is to help people understand that these are stereotypes, that they're not reflections of reality. Um, and you know, one of the ways that we can do that is by debunking these stereotypes. And I talk a little bit about that in the book, but I think what's, um, what I try to do in the book and, and what I've been trying to do more in my work is um, to explain that these stereotypes exist and to talk about where they come from and why, and why they exist and what their, what their, um, what their function is. And, and, and the way that they, um, you know, when we talk about Muslims as you know, inherently violent or oppressive to women or, you know, all these sorts of, um, you know, common tropes that we have about Muslims. It's, it's a way of um, uh, casting them in a negative light that makes us feel good and look good to ourselves. And so there's also kind of a, um, you know, we set up this, this stark contrast between us and them that really is not a mirror of reality. And so I think it's, it's one learning about um, these stereotypes and how they function and also being honest with ourselves that, um, you know, we, we don't always live up to the best idealized version of, of who we believe ourselves to be. That's not to say we need to, you know, uh, beat up on ourselves about that. Um, but, but to recognize, um, that, you know, all of our communities, Christian and Muslim are, are working hard to live in, ways that are pleasing to God and to help our, our neighbors. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think recognizing those stereotypes and reflecting on the ways that we might have internalized them is the first step. And that's, that's difficult to do. One of the, the ways that I've tried to um, help folks along in doing that is to talk about my own journey of, of unpacking these stereotypes in myself and the really uncomfortable ways that my bias has, um, that, I, that it, it's been made known to me <laughs> um, by different experiences. And I think when we are honest about our own journeys to overcome these stereotypes, um, that uh, gives others an opportunity to be honest and open with themselves and to work through those things. Yeah, and that's not fun. I, mean, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use that terminology, right? I guess this is, this is a hard conversation to have, a difficult conversation to have, um, and one that people can be quite reticent to have, which is weird if you think about it, because uh, we are very used to talking about our sin, both corporately and individually, uh, and you know, both of our traditions, uh, although we go about it in different ways, have a robust understanding of confession and of absolution and the importance of naming the junk. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, when you say Islamophobia or you know, discrimination or xenophobia or racism, um, these kind of become, you know, they, they are, not they don't become, but they are buzzwords that, that suddenly just people put up like, whoa, no, 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 we're not going there, you know, I, and that's, that's a whole big deal that's just being created by the left, being created by the media, mm -hmm. being a real thing, et cetera. So how do you navigate things like that? Uh, when you're addressing, you know, communities of Christians and calling them to confess, and yet they're like, this isn't even something I need to confess, you're making this up. 
Islamophobia is the first, you know, is, is right on the cover of my book. It, and I know that that will um, be a reason why a lot of people don't pick it up. Mm -hmm. And so I, I realize that there are, are a lot of people who, um, who are not going to read this book, but who, who, um, are, uh, who have views that um, are stereotypical and prejudicial, who, who need this, um, who need to hopefully be exposed to, to new ways of thinking about Muslims, but who may not pick up the book because of the title. Mm -hmm. But I, but actually, um, I think there is still a lot of work to do among um, folks who identify as liberal or progressive who on, on the face of it say, oh yeah, I'm against Islamophobia, but don't have a whole lot of experience or exposure and who themselves actually might hold on to a lot of these stereotypes too. And as you know, from, from reading the book, I talk about a, a number of experiences, uh, a number of personal experiences I've had with liberals who have honestly made some of the most anti-Muslim comments I have ever heard. Um, because again, these stereotypes, whether you're on the right or the left, have become kind of conventional wisdom. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of people, particularly in the Trump era, who came out against the Muslim ban and came out against Trump's Islamophobia because they didn't like Trump, not because they fully understood why Islamophobia was wrong. And I see this book as an opportunity to speak to people who... Um, may have an inclination that Islamophobia is wrong, but don't really know much about it or know where to go or, or who don't know what to do and who want advice on, you know, how can I, how can I talk to other people in my Christian community? Um, so I'm hoping that this can be a resource for other Christians who are hoping to speak to people, again, who I might not even be able to reach with this book. So um, I, the book is, is meant to be kind of just a link in this chain to, to that we can hopefully spread further into our Christian communities and in, in talking about this problem. As you said, you had to kind of unpack some of your own biases and I'm constantly going through uh, the process of that as, as, a, as a Lutheran uh, pastor who is in the world of Islamic studies and you know, finding new, new stuff that I have to go, oh, wait a second, why did I assume that? Why do I think that? How, why do I frame it that way? But I remember talking to one guy who, who said to me, and pardon the French, but this is what he said. He said, damn right I'm afraid of Muslims, Ken. Uh, and, and he's like, tell me why I shouldn't be, uh, which, which was refreshingly honest in a way, yeah. uh, uh, cause I didn't have to do this weird dance with him about what Islamophobia is and how it's at work. Um, but, but then I was kind of like, oh yeah, okay. So what do I do now? I, I don't, I don't want to say validate, but we can, uh, acknowledge the fact that they are, they, ha they are scared for a reason hmm. because they've only seen these negative depictions of Islam and Muslims in, in the media. And I think, you know, we can't be dismissive of that. I mean, we shouldn't, I don't think we should say that, you know, ultimately they're right to, to broad brush, you know, broad brushstroke Muslims because of the, you know, the negative things they've seen in the media, but we can understand why they have those, those feelings and those views. Um, and, and that's why I think, at least in my own work, a lot of what I try to do is to just showcase the religious diversity of Muslims and, and the, the really positive expressions of Islam that exist that mm. my community often doesn't get to see. And so it's, it's cumulative work, I think. Um, and it's, uh, there's no one size fits all remedy, I don't think. You know, Islamophobia, uh, while it needs to be addressed specifically, is also a symptom of a, of a larger structure and system that's at play here, right? Of, of this shift, particularly in the United States, uh, of Christians from a position of privilege to one of, of being part of a plurality of, of different um, traditions, cultures, religions, etc. And, and basically Christians are trying to figure out diversity and difference. And Islamophobia gives them a way to navigate that diversity and difference. Um, but, but we're wanting to kind of give them a different option in a different way uh, mm -hmm. to do so. And you focus in particular about your own, your own faith, your, your own Catholic mm -hmm. upbringing and, and background. Uh, mm -hmm. And you have a very rich set of resources to do that. Tell me a little bit more about that and how your Catholic faith in particular uh, mm -hmm. inspires, you know, knowing about and doing things about Islamophobia. Sure, um, I'll talk about two different, different aspects. Um, one, 
I, you know, I have to say that um, Pope Francis has really been an inspiration to me over the last several years. And obviously I was involved in this work and concerned about Islamophobia and working on Muslim Christian relations before Pope Francis came on the scene. Um, but he has made dialogue with Muslims a major priority in his papacy, as we saw in this past week with his trip to Iraq. Um, and what Pope Francis really is trying to do is to carry forward the legacy of uh, the Second Vatican Council uh, back in the 1960s, where the church made a renewed effort to reach out to those of other religious traditions and to also uh, emphasize the importance of religious freedom and, mm -hmm. uh, and not just not just for ourselves, but for others as well. And so you know, the legacy of, of Vatican II and this document called Nostra Aetate on interreligious dialogue, um, that is definitely an inspiration for me. And Pope Francis continues to, to live that out and to offer us an example of what that can look like. Um, I know a lot of Catholics do not like him precisely for this reason. <laughs> I think there's a real discomfort um, among a lot of Catholics uh, with his outreach to Muslims and the fact that he, um, I mean, what, what I find so amazing about him and the way he he sees this is, you know, our we our our sense of identity as Christians does not have to hinge on um, Muslims being an other. Mm. Um, that there there can be a we can still retain a sense of identity of what it means to be Christian without making Muslims look really bad without. Um, without setting up this us versus them kind of competition or this sense of we've got it right and you've got it wrong. Um, and, and so I really uh, have learned a lot from him and find a lot inspiring in that. Um, the, other, uh, the other set of resources from the Catholic tradition that has been uh, really interesting for me to engage with in this work on Islamophobia is Catholic social teaching, mm. which, um, yeah, a lot of people, even within the Catholic Church, don't know about. It's not something, unfortunately, that's taught very much in, in Catholic schools or in parishes and things like that. But um, basically, through uh, you know teaching documents, papal encyclicals, all of these um, documents that have come out from, from the Catholic Church over the last um, century or more, uh, the Church has these, these set of principles that guide are in, that are meant to guide our engagement um, with the world and how we should tackle different social issues. So um, things like uh, protecting human life and human dignity, uh, care for um, the common good, um, solidarity and subsidiarity, these different principles, which you know we can get more into if you'd like, um, that we can apply to lots of different social issues. So Catholics have used these to talk about climate change or um, the migrant crisis or um, lots of different things. And no one had really thought about these in concert with the problem of Islamophobia. And so that was one of the things that I was trying to do in the book. Uh, I mean, I'm sure people have thought about it. It's just no one has really written about it anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I uh, I wanted to engage with, with that set of resources from the Catholic tradition to say, okay, we have these broad principles of what it means to uh, to care for the people around us, and let's see how it applies to to Islamophobia. Yeah, and, and that's a real embodiment, I guess, of uh, the example that you you seek to follow in in Pope Francis, uh, if I may make that comparison. Uh, because as you mentioned, I mean, he's as we're doing this interview, coming is in uh, Iraq, uh, visited Egypt in 2017, Abu Dhabi in 2019. Uh, said of his visit at Al Azhar uh, University, you know, the, the, the uh, as often described, the Oxford University, the the, the Muslim world. I, I don't know what that says about you know <laughs> the university as much as it says about us and our standards and, and all of that. But it's a very prominent institution, uh, and and said of his conversation with the Grand Imam there that he was stimulated, he was inspired uh, by this conversation, which is quite the statement coming from the, the head of the the Catholic Church saying that. I was inspired and, and stimulated and, you know, engaged in a conversation with this grand imam uh, and that then pushed him to write 
about interreligious connection, uh, to plan future trips to places like the, the United Arab Emirates, to Iraq, uh, et cetera. And so likewise, your engagement with Muslims has, has pushed you into a re-engagement with your own tradition, which I know this is kind of like your, your last book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're getting a little bit onto that topic. Um, but yeah, I guess, what is one thing that you saw in a, in a new light uh, or that brought particular richness to your Catholic faith because mm -hmm. of your relationships with and, and dialogue with Muslims and your work on the, on the issue of Islamophobia? So when I was in college, I was really involved with the Muslim student group and uh, you know, ha happened to have a lot of Muslim friends and was really inspired by their dedication to praying. And I also saw the fruits that that produced in their life and the way that they were able to um, have a positive outlook and deal with stress and all these things that, um, you know, that, that, you know, I think are, are the product of having a relationship with God. And, you know, I had grown up um, in a Catholic community where I had gone to mass, you know, during the week and during, you know, on the weekend and had been, had learned all of these different Catholic ways to pray. Um, and when I first started dialoguing with Muslims as a, as a college student, I was honestly sort of, uh, I had been kind of disenchanted with my Catholicism. I had almost been so immersed in, in that, that I, I didn't see the, the beauty that was there and all the potential and all the things that it could offer me. And it was through dialogue with Muslims and seeing, uh, how wonderful their prayer life was and their community life was that made me realize, wait, I, you know, there are also good things in my own tradition, or I want to go look for the good things in my own tradition. Um, and, you know, it, it's been, it's been years since then. And, and one's prayer life goes up and down for sure. Um, but I know that my, my relationship with God in my own prayer life has been deeply impacted by the example that my Muslim friends set and they, their own regularity of prayer and commitment constantly is a motivator to me to check in on my relationship with God and to adopt practices that, that put me in touch with God. And so um, that has been, you know, such a gift. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of the, the real fruits of interreligious dialogue, I think, the, the way that um, our friendships can can in turn impact our relationship with God and other people. As a Lutheran who's coming at this, you know, I've also done, you know, some thinking about what what are some Lutheran distinctives that might point me in, in this direction. Um, and, you know, I've thought about things like our theology of the cross and God being very implicated in, in the, you know, the muck and the mess of this world and, and that being kind of a, a central tenet of our, our theology or our a very robust understanding of saint and sinner as a way to address the fact that we we are working towards the goal of, of not being discriminatory and yet we can also admit that we're islamophobic as a great way to address like liberal islamophobia right uh and, and things like that um but i also think of just practical conversations that i had I have a really good relationship with an imam uh, when i was working on my phd um, and we just talked about the craft of preaching you know, and like what it means to be, uh, you know, a khatib and what it means to be a preacher and like, how do you do that? And what are the differences? You know, and we, we joke too, like I said, I would, I wish that we had a, you know, requirement to take a break in the middle of the sermon. Like that'd be nice sometimes when I'm, when I'm cranking on a, on a big one, you know, or something like that, you know? So we, we had a relationship that was very practical in terms of his theology, but then I've had really rich conversations where my understanding of something as central as like mercy and grace has expanded right in conversations with muslims which like christians like to pretend we have the corner on mercy and grace you know, and that all other religions are as one thing i hear is like religions of the law they're, they're religions of the law and christianity is a religion of grace um and yet you know m multiple of, of my muslim friends have been like you know you talk about Islam being one where the God is a God of justice. You know, your understanding of God is that he threw his own son on the cross because the sin of the world was, was so bad. You know, this whole substitutionary atonement. Yeah. Theory, you know, that is a God of justice. Um, and, and, and God doesn't expect that of us 
or expect that of anyone within Islam. Uh, and that's more a God of mercy, that, that, that there is no, you know, substitutionary atonement, no propitiatory sacrifice. Like this, this is, he removes that from it and says, I'm going to take care of this. I'm, I'm God of the cosmos. I take care of these cosmological things um, and, and calls you to more of a daily, uh, you know, submission to that reality. Um, and, and that's, it's been something I've wrestled with, you know, uh, and, and continue to unpack. And I don't know if I have the answers, but at least these are good questions and good conversations to be having, right? Absolutely. And I, I relate so much to, to what you've just shared. And I've had a lot of similar reflections myself. And what's been so wonderful about dialogue is these sorts of things come up. And then it also, um, at least for me, has propelled me back into the Christian tradition to say, okay, what are other atonement theories? Like, that's not the only atonement theory. Right. That's not the only way to understand what is happening with the cross or what is happening with the incarnation. Um, and uh, so it's also, a there are, there are multiple ways within our tradition, even outside of our conversations with Muslims, I mean, that, that have happened, you know, internally within the tradition that we can draw from and and those um, those theological conversations. I mean, it's it's some of my favorite thing to do. It's why I'm in a you know PhD program in theology and have Muslim classmates and you know we talk about this stuff all the time. And I I joke. Um, so I a couple years ago I was in a a course with you know I'm Catholic and then I had a Sunni classmate and a Shia classmate and it was a course on the Reformation. And so it was like the beginning of a bad joke, like a Catholic, a Shia oh. and a Sunni walk into a class on Martin Luther, you right. know, and, but it's, it's so um, fruitful to be able to work out our theologies and conversation with each other. And, um, and, and it's sometimes is surprising where we have similarities and where we have differences because it's not always where we expect they're going to be. And, um, and it also is, helpful this is something that one of my professors talks about it's helpful um for us to be able to understand that there are multiple perspectives in both of our traditions because when we come into dialogue sometimes we reduce christianity to this and islam to that and like one theological interpretation over here and one theological interpretation over there but you know in, in in our own communities there's a lot of internal debate i mean catholics and lutherans you know we <laughs> You know, we've had, uh, you know, our two communities have had lots of disagreements, so we can't, um, can't boil Christianity down to one thing. To say the least, yeah, <laughs> to say the least. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm reminded of a, of a conversation that occurred in Houston that had like a couple of different Christians and a couple of different Muslims, and they had, uh, I think, yeah, Shia and, and Sunni representatives, and then um, I, I can't remember the, the folks that were representing Christians, um, but uh, because I the main conversation that occurred was really between the Sunni and the Shia representatives. Like that, they started like just talking to one another. And it was like the Christians were just hanging out there on the side, right? Um, because in this process, you can also sometimes just have a totally new perspective on intra-Christian relations and how we understand our relationships to uh, other people that are not mostly not Christian. Like again, how are we just dealing with diversity and difference in our world? Uh, today and, and 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 working through some of those things, so I think that's that's really fruitful stuff for for people to be considering um, as as they do this and and to see again um, scripture in a new light to to read like for me the Imago Dei to understand the image of God in a brand new light uh, according to my interactions with with Muslims and or John four and the Samaritan woman at the well and yeah. you know and, and talking about yeah this is in some ways a neighbor religion, but also an other religion that Jesus is, is talking across here. Um, and I always raise up to people, it's not him talking. There's not a lot of red text. Uh, if you have that old red letter Bible, it's a lot of listening, uh, you know, in, in this interaction. Other than those kind of, I guess, kind of bigger uh, issues and things like that, uh, one of my last questions is what practical steps could individuals or congregations take um, to start to make this change other than reading your mm -hmm. book and other than like wrestling with seriously the, the stuff that you present there, uh, what mm -hmm. are some things that are like first steps you might recommend for them? You know, it's important for people to recognize that Islamophobia is more than just bias and prejudice. It's also the ways that governments target Muslims. It's, it's um, you know, these subtle stereotypes that circulate over and over in the media 
Um, you know, one story I talk about in the book is um, a friend and colleague of mine who um, was spied on by law enforcement. Or we think about even for, uh, you know, American wars abroad and how that is kind of an expression of Islamophobia in a sense, the ways that Muslim communities are targeted. So because Islamophobia is such a multifaceted issue, there's going to be a lot of different ways that we need to address this. Um, in terms of uh, the biases and the fear that people have, I think it's having, um, having conversations that are truthful and honest about, um, about, you know, when we call, when we see Islamophobia, uh, we need to call it out. But I, I think there are ways that, um, that we can do it that will pay off in the long term, even if in that moment of conversation, people are not converted, so to speak. This has been one of the things that's been, um, that was really frustrating and difficult for me for a long time, where I would have a conversation with someone who shared with me some anti-Muslim views or said something that was, was wrong. And I would come away from the conversation thinking, oh man, like I didn't do a good job because they're walking away with the same views that they had before. But I think the goal in those sorts of conversations isn't to you know, initiate an immediate sort of change of heart, but rather to kind of lay the groundwork um, and and plant the seeds. That's a metaphor I use in the book, kind of plant the seeds and till the soil. Um, and to, you know, so when people say, oh, um, Muslims are like this, or why are all Muslims like that? To just say, you know, actually, that's not been my experience, or I don't see it that way, or why, or even pose the question back to them, why do you, you know, why do you think that way? And to, to begin to kind of destabilize these stereotypes, even if it might be a ways down the line before those things are fully dismantled. Um, you know, I one way I've been thinking about it recently is, you know, we can open the door for people, but they have to walk through themselves because we can't, you know, people, when people are fearful, you can't force them to do anything. It has to come from a place of freedom and, um, and and all we can do is to to I think uh, lay the groundwork for that. Um, and you know, and and sometimes I, I want to be clear that I think there are times and places where calling things out in a very straightforward and unapologetic way is very important. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think there are, are times where we can take a more cumulative and gradual approach if we're dealing if we're trying to bring people along with us in terms of transforming attitudes and 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 hearts and things like that um i also think that you know in terms of more tangible um steps we can take to support muslims i mean if there is a you know some sort of anti-muslim hate crime in your community um to express support to, you know to have your congregation express support whether um, you know, by making a phone call, uh, putting up a, a poster, coming over to help clean up. I mean, I talk in the book about a number of examples where Christian communities really quickly mobilize to yeah. clean up the vandalism at churches and, or at mosques and things like that. Um, but then also, I think a lot of this uh, response to Islamophobia is going to involve a type of uh, activism in the political sphere. And, um, you know, that's not to say, again, that that Islamophobia is a clear partisan issue or that, you know, um, it's always going to be about calling out Islamophobia on the right. It's often going to be about calling uh, attention to Islamophobia on the left yeah. um, and and pushing back against all these um, these anti-Muslim policies. And, you know, yes, the Muslim ban has been rescinded, but that doesn't mean that government uh, government sanctioned Islamophobia in the United States has gone away. So there's lots of different forms of activism. Um, I mean, Christian communities have been at the forefront too of welcoming Muslim refugees from around the world. And that's hugely important. Um, and the last thing that I guess I can say, and you know, obviously there's always more to say is, is that we can be, um, be open with our fellow Christians about uh, the ways that we have grappled with and and in some cases overcome the stereotypes that we've had. Because I think when we do that, we give other people license to search search their own hearts about um, you know what um, what sins we need to to repent to kind of go back to that um, to that way of talking about it. 
Yeah, as you hinted at, there, this is a massive task and there's a lot of work to be done. There's going to be a lot of listening and learning, a lot of dialoguing and discerning uh, along the way. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground uh, and we, we've talked for, for quite a while, but I wanted to make sure uh, to ask you just an open-ended blank check question at the end. If there's like one thing you're really hoping to talk about today, would you get the chance to, uh, or mm -hmm. one thing you want to say about uh, the book uh, for people to know before they get it, uh, what is it? There's a lot of stories in the book that are really painful to read, um, but are really important for Christians to be aware of because Islamophobia has inflicted a lot of suffering on our Muslim siblings and faith. And I, I think if anything else, we need to have a little bit more exposure to those sorts of stories um, to, to really have a sense of what the problem is. At the same time, I also hope that readers come away with a sense of hope and encouragement to say, um, you know, we can do this, we can help make things better. Um, and that this isn't a contradiction um, this isn't a contradiction of our faith, but a natural outgrowth of what it means to be Christian. And to know that even if we may face opposition in our Christian communities in doing this work, that, um, that we, we can be confident that this is um, an important task and something that God is calling us to. Yeah. And I think in the book, you do uh, a good job of honoring, uh, those Muslim experiences and, and sharing some of those then also uh, this uh, great uh, effective summons or call to action among Christians to address this, to talk about this and do something about it. I'm so thankful we had the opportunity to talk today and to address some of these things in, in more detail, to hear it from you directly uh, and to have this conversation with you. Wow, what a humble honor. Thank you so much, Jordan. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's been great to talk. 